At the turn of the century, America was rapidly becoming an industrial society. Nearly 30 million immigrants had risked the long trip to the New World with dreams of a better life. Many found their way to the textile mills of New England, where the opportunity was work with low wages, long hours, and dangerous working conditions. The factory system ushered in new demands for efficiency and control. I regard my people just as I regard my machinery. Discrimination in the mills was widespread. Recruiting wagons, known as slavers, sought out young women and children who they could pay half as much as men. A family industry, they called it. I used to go to school, and then a man came by to my house and asked my father why I didn't go to work. The man said, you give me four dollars and I will make papers come from the old country which say she is 14. I went to work and in about two weeks got hurt in my head. The machine pulled my scalp off. I was in the hospital seven months. One out of every three mill workers died before the age of 25. Unions gained popularity among workers seeking better working conditions. The American Federation of Labor had won an eight-hour day for thousands of craft workers. But unskilled textile workers remained unorganized. In 1911, the Massachusetts State Legislature reduced the working week from 56 to 54 hours. Unwilling to let workers benefit, Lawrence's American Woolen Company, the world's largest textile plant, cut workers' wages. On January 12, 1912, when workers received their paychecks, cries of short pay rang throughout the mill. 14,000 workers poured into the streets. Better to start fighting than to starve working! In two weeks, 25,000 workers from 11 mills had joined the strike. The city of Lawrence sounded a riot call. The workers had shut down the largest mills in the world. Mill owners kept their machines running, although no cloth was being woven, in an attempt to deceive the strikers. Carrying banners that read bread and roses, the strikers expressed their demand for livable wages, bread, but also for dignity and respect, for roses in their lives. The industrial workers of the world, or Wobblies, sent nationally known labor leaders to organize the strike. They formed strike committees, representing workers of 30 nationalities, held parades and put up picket lines. Labeled anarchists, agitators, and fomenters of violence by the press, the strike leaders warned the unarmed workers not to resort to violence. Wobbly leader Bill Haywood. They cannot weave cloth with bayonets. By all means, make this strike as peaceful as possible. All the blood spilled will be your blood. Company guards sprayed workers in picket lines with freezing cold water from high-pressure hoses. The city of Lawrence called in the state militia, and on January 29th, police and troopers opened fire on a crowd of strikers, killing a young woman striker named Anna Lopeza. As resources diminished, the children of strikers were sent to stay with supporters in other cities. The children's pilgrimage drew national sympathy to the Lawrence strikers. The mill owners were outraged. On the morning of February 24th, 40 children gathered at the railroad station with their families. Without warning, club-wielding police attacked the parents and children. The nation reacted with horror. Every right supposedly guaranteed under the Constitution has been ruthlessly taken from the industrial slaves of Lawrence. I would rather never again wear a thread of woolen than know my garments had been woven at the cost of such misery as I have seen. In response to national outrage, President Taft ordered an investigation 
Many strikers, including a delegation of 16 children, testified before Congress about working conditions in the mills. With public support on their side, the strike committee made a final appeal. On March 12th, three months after workers had walked off their jobs, the American Woolen Company, speaking for all Lawrence Mills, surrendered. Two days later, 25,000 men, women and children strikers gathered on the Lawrence Common and voted on the settlement. The workers had won wage increases, overtime pay and rules against discrimination. You have demonstrated the common interest of the working class. In bringing all nationalities together, you have won the most single victory of any body of organized workers in the world. Though the victory was an example to textile workers in all of New England, the dream of one big union was short-lived. It would be another quarter of a century before industrial workers would form a union strong enough to win lasting gains.